Tsunami Studios. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, The Last Ronin, Issue 1. A couple of things before we actually get into this review that I need to make peace with, just because these are things that are very important to me. First off, I did an entire Geek Wave episode talking about my thoughts on this before it came out. It's one of the earliest Geek Waves I've done. I still don't think you need to make the turtles dark and gritty. I don't believe that's what you should do with them. And I wanted to make my piece of that before going into this book. Like, well, I'll go in with an open mind. But I think you can tell a mature story with the turtles without making it go super dark and gritty. And before we get into this book, still, I want to point out the difference between being dark and gritty and being miserable and gritty. There's a difference between dark and miserable. Dark is stuff we've seen before in Ninja Turtles. We've seen in almost every incarnation, the show or the movies can go to dark places. They can show us things that happen that are insane and dark and mysterious and creepy and weird and make us feel like there's some serious nature going on in this. This book is none of those things. This book is miserable, it's emotionless, it is pointless, and it, it has it has no emotional stakes whatsoever. I don't want anybody to go in there thinking this is going to be a love letter to the Ninja Turtles like the creator said. This is not a love letter to the Ninja Turtles. This is the opposite of a love letter. It feels like a spite letter. That's like, you guys like the turtles? Well, what if we made them dark and creepy and gritty and everyone's sad and nothing's really cool going on? Everything you love about the Ninja Turtles, I don't care what incarnation you like the turtles in. Whether you like the movies, whether you like the cartoons, whether you like the action figures, or whether you like the comic books, this is not a good representation of the Ninja Turtles in any format. I want to get that out of the way before we get into that book. I also want to just leap while we're ahead right now. The turtle that's alive is Michelangelo. I feel like a lot of people are going to think this is a big reveal. Don't, don't think that. I don't want you to go in here thinking that it's going to be some revelation that it's Michelangelo. We've pretty much set it up from the freaking beginning of the announcement that's going to be Michelangelo. We saw the font. It was orange. We get it. It makes sense it's Michelangelo because we want to show how dark and edgy we are, but we're not dark and edgy, we're just miserable, you know? I want to say this too, this is not a good characteristic of the Michelangelo character. I don't think there's any world in any interpretation of the Michelangelo character we've seen that this is where he would end up if everyone he loved died. I do not buy that for one second, and it absolutely sucks that that's what we're seeing in this book that's supposed to be a love letter to the Ninja Turtles. It's not, and I hate to say that because it's Eastman and Laird that made this book. They wrote it, they created it, this is their story, and it feels like they hate the Turtles. I don't know why, I just hate that feeling that the guys that created this just really missed the mark on something that's supposed to be this awe-inspiring book that shows a future with these turtles it doesn't do any of that so let's get into the book before i completely lose my cool some even more we open up we get some narration from michelangelo and this is i'm already right off the bat i'm pissed off at this book we're doing something i hate and that is we are seeing the ghosts of the turtles we are seeing the ghosts of all three turtles talking to the michelangelo who's still alive that is such a stupid trope that i hate if you have a dead character, make them stay dead. Having them be like a something that is just like a ghost or an idea or like a memory in their head, it cheapens the fact that they're already dead. It would be more personal and more intimate if we saw Michelangelo alone through each and every one of these scenes. And then at the end of the book, like we see when he's having the dream where he sees his brothers again, that's where you get the impact. The fact that they're here, it bothers me. So Michelangelo is like walking through a murky swamp. He's kind of just narrating how like mankind's pollution and everything killed itself because of course it did, you know, Ugh, of course it did. So he's headed to a big city. It's, I guess it's kind of like a new New York kind of thing, and he's just kind of walking about. He's trying to sneak in there without being seen, because, of course, in this future, mutants are still outlawed. I don't... Okay, I don't... I, I guess they're not really outlawed as they are extinct, for lack of a better term there, and it's just okay. It's just... I, I just don't know. It's just so annoying. So he's trying to steal a bike without getting caught, but he's doing a bad job at it, and he gets... He gets caught easily and these robots come after him after he like kind of crashes the bike and blows it up as a distraction and he thinks it's a robot but it's like a human synthet synthetic thing that's inside like um like a machine and it's just like real okay I kind of like the angle that it's like foot soldiers that they're police that's kind of cool 
I guess, but I'm just like, okay, that's, that's okay. And the entire time, Michelangelo is trying to be like this dark creature, but again, I just, I don't feel that from him and I never have. I, I can't pinpoint how far in the future we are just because the ages are all over the place. I don't know. I just find it very annoying. And I just, it's just so boring. So we realize who he's after and his name is Uroku Hirito, Hiroto or something. It's Uroku Hirito, something to that regard. I don't have the name in front of me, so I don't remember the specifics of the name, but realize this person that Michelangelo is hunting down is the grandson of the Shredder and the bastard son of Karai. And he's like this big tech whatever now, and he's just, he's like controlling the city because he's so rich and cool. And of course, you know, it's like that thing. It's like, you want to make it a dark future. So you're going to put like what the dark guy, the bad guy in charge. I, you're not Blade Runner. Like you're trying to be like a mix of like Blade Runner meets like some other dystopian bullshit, but it doesn't come across as interesting or cool. I just, it's just so basic. Like you want to make this something that is about the Ninja Turtles, about the turtles, and you don't have any of the original villains, just the grandson. Not even like a classic looking foot soldier, just like a robot foot soldier who's a police officer. Okay, fine. They're dead, that's fine, everyone's dead. But the grandson of the Shredder is our bad guy? We've never met this character before, so how is this gonna feel like a long lasting thing? And I get it, it's the first issue, maybe there'll be some reveals later on, but it's just so painful that this is where we're starting? I don't like it. So Michelangelo breaks into his facility, he's trying to take everybody down, and he's doing an okay job, but the entire time I'm just like, come on. Why is this trying, why is he trying so hard to be this brooding character? I just never, there is no future where Michelangelo becomes brooding. Even if his brothers and his father were murdered, I don't believe Michelangelo becomes this brooding character. I don't buy it. And the stuff later on of him, I like even less that he does. So yeah, he goes in, he's trying to fight this Oroku kid. He gets his ass kicked because he's an old man and he literally bursts out of a building. He's probably falling to his death. Luckily he's a turtle, so he'll survive it. And we get a couple other things in here. We get some, re we get, I guess, some revelation that Oroku Harito has Kurai still alive and she's like in some cryogenic stasis. Okay, that's what, I don't care. I, I don't, I get it. You want to build up this world a bit, but who cares? Unless she puts on the Shredder armor, there is nothing cool that can be done with that character. And if even if this grandson of the Shredder puts on the Shredder armor, I don't think it's that impactful or cool. Because we're not seeing, like, the descendant of one of the turtles fighting the descendant of the Shredder. We're seeing a miserable old turtle trying to fight it. I hate that idea. It's just so miserable for no reason. Like, I get it, you want to make your dystopian future, but why does it have to be like, pollution killed a lot of people, my brothers were killed by these ninjas, and they took over the world. That's not very Ninja turtle -y. it's just very, you want to make your, your dystopian science fiction universe, and you're trying to do it in a way that you're going to get people to read it. Like, it doesn't feel, it. I, I keep coming back to that, it's not a love letter to the turtles like they wanted it to be. It's not. It's just painful and miserable and you're not going to feel anything towards the character of Michelangelo or this new Oroku, you're not going to feel anything towards them. So Michelangelo hits the pavement, he feels like he's defeated. There's one kind of cool moment in there where he's kind of like struggling to get up, he's like, I failed you, I failed you, my family. That's like the only cool moment in this book for me, just because that's kind of like a Ronin thing to do. That being said, I never expected Michelangelo to be the one that becomes the samurai or the ninja or the ronin. He just doesn't fit that bill. And it's just so weird that that's where it's going. So we see he he's, he gets away into the sewers. We're done with him. There's this group of people. I guess you could say they're the purple dragons. They never really name them. But this one woman there, we learn her name has Jones at the end. So it's like, ooh, who's she going to be related to? Like, we don't already know who it's going to be. Like, come on, that's not a big shocker. You said it literally the first thing she said. The first thing somebody says to that woman, they say her name Jones in it. So it's like, oh, is she going to be related to Casey? Yeah, 
That's not a surprise. <laughs> it's really not a surprise. So then we're down in the sewers and Michelangelo is just still moping about and he's about to kill himself. He's literally about to take the sword of his brother and stab it into his chest because he failed them and he can't go back and do it again. I don't know how long it's been. Michelangelo is looking really rough around the edges here. I don't know how turtles age, but it's been such a long time. And this is also a part that bothers me. Like, why is it now? you're coming out for revenge you make it sound like your brothers have been dead for a long time we don't really specify when they died and i guess they even say that this Oroku did kill them or like extinguish the mutants for lack of a better term so maybe it's more recently than we're led to believe but i'm still like you're carrying around their bandanas and their weapons so it has to have some resonance where it's not just a recent thing right why are you waiting till now to do it and I just, this really made me mad. This made me think like, this is not, a, again, it's not respected to the turtles. He's trying to be like the cool, I'm the dark hero, I'm the samurai who I failed, and now I gotta commit whatever the hell those people commit. And it's just so stupid. It's just so stupid. I really don't like what that did. It did not make any sense to me why Michelangelo, after having, what, you have one moment to do this. this you've had, what, I, I'm going to say years to plan this. You fail once and now it's like time to kill yourself because you dishonored your family. The honorable thing to do because you've been trained to do this in every incarnation is never give up and try again. So now you're going to give up right now because you're miserable and you're going to kill yourself and only when the child walks in do you have a glimpse of a good life oh it's so pain it's so stupid uh, it, it really sucks to say that because how can i say something is bad when it's, or how it means something other than what's presented when the original creators of the turtles are the ones doing this how can i say i know better than them when it comes to their own creation i don't know it's so weird that way but i feel like i just get what it's trying to say but it's not getting that across all right okay right so here's what it's trying to say i think what it's trying to say is the world is in shambles and only michelangelo can be the hero to bring it back because of everything that's happened to his family he's weighed down by guilt and these ideas of revenge and driving force to bring down the, the new shredder for lack of a better term the new shredder i think that's what it's trying to say but what's coming across is here is a miserable old man who is so dead set on revenge and is literally bloodthirsty for killing this child. Well, he's not a child, but just killing this young man that he's willing to kill himself if it means failure to him. That is not the way Master Splinter taught these turtles. That's not the way Michelangelo has ever acted before. And that's not what you'd want to do to show that you care about your ninja turtles that's just a weird choice to make and i don't get it and i wish i did i wish i could say i understood the choices made here but they're just so painstakingly ridiculous and over the top and outlandish you'd want to be mad max you want to be blade runner well do those you don't have to have three dead turtles who ghosts are haunting the one that's left alive you don't have to have all these people dead from the previous stories you can have some impact of those people being alive wouldn't this story make okay wouldn't this story be a lot cooler if the other turtles were still alive doing other things like maybe they have given up the way of vengeance and Michelangelo is the one who is trying so hard to like avenge their father. And then even Leonardo who's, or Raphael, one of those two is just like, Mikey, like it's been years. We cannot keep doing this. It's not our way. Our father would want us to grieve for him and never seek out vengeance. But here is this turtle trying to avenge his dead family and just comes across as so shallow, so emotionless, and it doesn't do anything that I'm enjoying. So, like I said, we get a dream sequence where Michelangelo is kind of technically dead for a minute, and then he sees the vision of his brothers, like, oh, you're finally awake, you're here, look at us, we're all a family again, yada, yada, yada. He wakes up in a hospital bed, and who comes out of the shadows to see him? It's April. And this is where I can't understand the age, because she looks like she's aged only a couple, maybe a couple decades. Like, I don't know how you guys picture April O'Neil to be in age when you read her. I understand if this is a follow up to the IDW series that's going on. I understand. Well, maybe that April's like 20 and now here she'd be like 50. So it's like 30 years. But I'm just like, 
does this make me feel anything? Does the idea of you shoving April in here do anything to make me feel this book has any more stakes to it or anything cooler going on? Because surely, surely, if Master Splinter, Donatello, Raphael, and Leonardo are all dead, they would have went for April and Casey. So if those two are still alive, I would want to know why and I want to know if there's a good reason for it. There's so much about this book I don't like so much and it's going to be such a weird thing to it's just so weird to say that this thing that's this edgy well it's trying to be edgy this idea created by Eastman and Laird the guys who made these characters originally in this edgy format in the 80s and they just missed the mark completely when it came to this story I don't know if anybody else feels this way but I just think like if you want to do an edgy, dark, gritty idea for the turtles, you don't have to have three of them dead. The other one is a bloodthirsty psychopath willing to kill himself to avenge somebody. I don't think that's in the spirit of the turtles, even from their original conception. And I get you're trying to go for like that Ronin thing where he's like a, the last samurai trying to fight his way to the top to kill the man who killed his family. But it doesn't work. Not for Michelangelo, not for the way we've seen these turtles before. If it's an homage to the Mirage comic book, maybe. But even that, I'm like, that was dark, but it wasn't miserable. Nobody there was like bitter of their own existence or like wanting to commit suicide or just bitter and angry towards the world for no reason. You know, I don't, I don't like that. I don't like this book. And there's too many variant covers. I can't even count how many variant covers there is. You don't need that many variant covers. People are going to buy this either way. Okay? So just stop with the variant covers. They're just so pointless. They're just so pointless. The artwork's fine. I have no complaints about the artwork. It looks good for the most part. I'm on board with the artwork. Stop with the variant covers, please. So this was a really long-winded review, and I'm probably going to continue reviewing these books just because I have so much to say about it. I don't know if I'll get this aggressive in each, in each one, but I did not enjoy this. I cannot tell you guys to go out and read this. I cannot tell you this is going to be the story you want for your Ninja Turtles. This isn't even like the final turtle story. This is just, we are in an alternate universe where one of the turtles who we've always seen to be the happy-go-lucky party guy, who is more emotional than he is than any of the other turtles. Michelangelo is more emotional than any of the other turtles. But in this, they just make him this piss-poor character who is out for revenge. And I don't believe Michelangelo would ever be that character. This is not dark and gritty. It's not a love letter. This is a miserable, sad sack of shit. That is an aggressive letter saying, this is the only way the turtles can be cool is if we make them this mysteriously stupid, gritty, and annoying. So I cannot recommend this book to you. I'm going to give TMNT, The Last Ronin, issue one, a three out of 10. Now you guys, I have something I would like to share with you. I have been thinking about a story involving a future state for the Ninja Turtles for a long time. It's actually something I've wanted to write and work on for years, just develop it in some format. If you guys are interested in hearing my version of a turtle's future that is not as dark as this, it's not as miserable as this, but it still goes to some very intense, traumatic places, please let me know in the comments if you'd like to hear my version of a Ninja Turtles future story. Now, I'd be very happy to do a video talking about it, and then maybe someday it could be turned into something. We'll see. But I just wanted to share that with you guys. If you are unhappy with this book like I am, or you want to hear my idea for a Ninja Turtle story set in the future, please leave it in the comments below, and I will do a video talking about it. So, I hate this book. Don't buy it. Don't support this book. Don't go out of your way and buy every variant cover. It's not worth your time. It's not worth the effort. So thank you guys so much for watching this rant slash review. As always, be sure to like and subscribe to the channel. You can catch me on Instagram, Patreon, Twitter, all that good stuff. And I'll see you in the next one. Have fun. Stay safe. Good luck.